Why do we want to talk about HVAC? I've done over 500 speaking engagements, and I used to start my, my presentation with a simple question. We'll divide your energy usage into three parts. First part is your furnace air conditioner and water heater. Your second part is your appliances. And your third part is lighting. Which is the biggest energy user? Now, we all know the answer in here, but when I did speaking engagements to the general public, I used to get about a third, a third, and a third. A third would pick HVAC, a third would pick lighting, a third would pick appliances. Not a trick question. HVAC is 75% of our energy usage. You know, they asked Willie Sutton, why do you rob banks? He says, that's where the money is. So if you really want to make savings, you really got to deal with your HVAC. You can give dishwasher tips or laundry tips or dryer, but the big money is HVAC. Now, one little tidbit that I might find amusing, the best group I ever had in answering that question was the second and third graders at Detroit 6 Police Precinct. Seventy percent of them got it right. The worst group I ever had was Retired Teachers Association. Zero out of 80 got it right. So second graders should have been teaching the teachers. I think it's kind of scary to think that zero out of 80 knew that and they're the ones doing the teaching. So we have a great panel uh, going over HVAC and we'll uh, start with Mike Schaefer. Thank you, thank you. Thank you everyone for having me. I am from Chicagoland area as well, so I came over from Illinois. So thanks for having me here. I'm looking forward to talking, every, talking to everybody here a little bit about HVAC and how heat pumps, specifically air source heat pumps for me, kind of converge with what we're talking about today. So I am the performance instruction manager for Mitsubishi Electric. I live out of Chicagoland area, but I cover 12 states. So I have from North Dakota all the way over to West Virginia. So I have a very wide berth of different climate zones and climate areas and different situations to deal with. Luckily, a lot of what I wanted to cover today has kind of already been touched upon. So with the great builders and architects and industry partners we had go before me, a lot of it is kind of recap now for actually what was done. The first thing I want to talk about was beneficial electrification which Tim covered immediately right at the beginning. So I don't really have to put a focus on that, but from, from what Tim explained, beneficial or strategic electrification, however we want to say that, it's absolutely coming. It's a growing trend. It's happening. We've seen the Rocky Mountain Institute study mentioned several times. Well, here's some more that were done just last year. This is all talking about strategic or beneficial electrification. It absolutely is happening. It, like everything, it starts on East Coast, West Coast, then eventually converges into the Midwest. So if we haven't seen it yet, we will. It's happening. What these studies are all showing is strategic electrification not only is happening, it has to happen. We heard about gas moratoriums. Same thing is happening in Massachusetts right now as well. It's A lot of it is not only having to do with limiting fossil fuels, but a lot of it is just, it's the infrastructure. Infrastructure is a big thing that when, it, when the infrastructure was built for the city of Boston, however many hundreds of years ago, it wasn't built to, ma to handle the amount of homes and people that are actually there right now. So it's not so much that there's a shortage of natural gas or trying to drive totally away from fossil fuels, it's just that the infrastructure can't handle it. You can't handle a gas meter under your house. It just can't be done. So those things are occurring. And what these studies are all showing is the two main fixes is transportation, so electrical vehicles, electric vehicles, and then building decarbonization, with the big thing being heat pumps. Whether it's air source, ground source, whatever it might be, it's heat pumps. It's getting off of fossil fuels and leaning more towards heat pumps. This is a little snapshot, and it shows New York, New England area, but it's kind of common for pretty much everywhere, when it looks at where our actual energy usage, is, energy usage is at, the fossil fuel usage. Primarily, it is your residential and your commercial space and water heat. So that's where all of our fossil fuel energy is being used. It's residential and commercial space and water heat. Obviously, we have the transportation portion, 
which hopefully electric vehicles can help take that over. And then we have that industrial portion, which is something else that will have to be handled entirely. So we're focusing here on your space and your water use. 46% of fossil fuel usage is space and water use. That's where heat pumps come into play. Heat pumps, air source heat pumps, ground source heat pumps for your space heating, heat pumps for your water heating, a lot of different things, but that's where heat pumps come into play. Minnesota did a study this last year that actually shows where the biggest potential for energy savings on a home is at. And number one, what they came up with, your biggest potential for energy savings on a home is by installing cold climate ductless wastewater systems. That's your biggest opportunity for energy savings on a home. Whether it's to take over for that space conditioning or to supplement. So a lot of what we do with ductless systems, air source heat pumps, is supplementing heating and cooling as well. So if they already have a natural gas furnace in the home, we can supplement that heating and cooling by putting in a ductless mini split system and taking some of that load away from the furnace that's already there. So we can still increase the efficiency of the home without completely getting rid of a gas system that may already be there. Now talking about air source heat pumps. Has, ever, has anyone in here not had an experience with a ductless air source heat pump? What's the number one objection we normally get with a ductless air source heat pump? It's aesthetics, it's always. <laughs> You're not gonna hurt my feelings. Always, always is, I don't wanna see that on my wall. That's generally, that's the biggest hurdle that we have to overcome to get air source heat pumps into homes, ductless heat pumps into homes. I don't want to see that wall mount unit on my wall. That's our number one thing. Well, this is where a big misconception lays at with air source heat pumps, is it's not just this. There's a multitude of different products that are out there from a ductless air source heat pump standpoint. It's not just wall mounted ductless, there's floor mounted, there's ceiling recessed units, there's new, our new one-way cassette, which actually recesses into 69 center standard joist spacing. So some real advancements that have come along from the ductless side to get these products into American homes. Go anywhere else in the world, this is the number, way, number one way of heating and cooling anywhere else in the world, except for here. So Tom mentioned earlier about ducted. Ryan mentioned it too. It's not just ductless. It's ducted systems as well. I'm not anti-ductwork at all. We've, no, we've noticed, especially Tom mentioned it right away, that closed off rooms, just by utilizing airshare strategies, doesn't actually really work that well from a comfort standpoint when you're utilizing strictly a ductless system. You need to get the air into those rooms. Is it livable? Absolutely. But it may not be comfortable. Now, <clears throat> Different parts of the world, people put up with different comfort than we put up with here. So a five to six degree temperature swing in Germany may not be that bad, but most homeowners here aren't putting up with a five to six degree temperature swing in their bedroom from the main living space. So we have to start utilizing some ducted equipment to move air into those closed off rooms. Whether that's one of these compact ducted units or a full air handler. We do a lot of work with full air handlers not only from new construction, but also from retrofit. So a big advantage where a full air handler can come into play in a retrofit scenario is if you're updating a home, tightening up a home, deep energy retrofit on a home, the air sealing, some duct sealing, you can take that existing system that's out and put in a ducted mini split heat pump system to get the advantages of this system while still utilizing the existing duct system in the house. So it's very traditional for a homeowner from that standpoint. Plus we can take over all those closed off spaces as well. So not only from looks is this not your traditional heat pump, but also from operation standpoint. What's, I mean, heat pumps have been around for a very, very long time, but a very common misconception with heat pumps is that heat pumps don't work here, right? They don't work in a colder climate. Well, it's not true anymore. Technology has changed and it's ever evolving. We look at cold climate heat pumps now. This is just Mitsubishi for an example. 
but we actually hold 100% heating capacity down to five degrees. So five degrees, we're actually getting what we're getting today out of heat. And our Mitsubishi's hyperheat systems, which are the cold climate heat pumps for us, maintain about 82% capacity on average at minus 13 still. So we're talking very, very high capacities still in deep negative temperatures. Now, does it get colder than minus 13? Absolutely, it does, right? But that's not where the system stopped working. That's just a where we stopped creating standpoint for a drive for the system. So very, very effective and very, very efficient. So we know they work. We have tons of studies that show that they work. I mean, real life examples, tons of case studies. Tom talked about the first passive house in Chicago, the Lima Passive House. If you go to Mitsubishi's website, we have a case study on that Lima Passive House that was done the first time in Chicago. So very, very many case studies and proof, but is it economical? That's the next question that we get. We know that they work. Is it economical? What is a problem that we have with trying to electrify homes? Is natural gas is extremely cheap. And I'm not negative, completely negative on natural gas. Obviously, I want to limit it and try to get away from that as much as we can. But there have been some good, good advancements in natural gas furnaces. I'm sure Sean will probably talk about a Detson product or something that's coming up. They, there's been some big advancements on that. So but that's moving in the right direction, but I still want to try to get off of natural gas if we can. So if we look at it from a efficiency standpoint and actually cost to operate equipment, I'm going to go in here so I can read these appropriately. This was done in Minnesota. Our utilities manager, Kevin DeMaster, that covers the same area that I do, did this study for Minnesota. So I'm just referencing it here, even though the utility data may be a little bit different. So we looked. he looked at the most common forms of heating systems for a home. So he has propane natural gas, electric resistance heat, and then cold climate heat pumps, which would be like the Mitsubishi hyperheat system. So if we look at the utility costs here, we can see the cost per gallon for propane, per therm for natural gas. These don't have any delivery rates or anything figured in there. We're just looking at straight therm or kilowatt hour cost. When we get to the cold climate heat pumps, you can see that the utility cost, the kilowatt hour is the same, obviously, from electric resistance to the cold climate heat pump, because it's an electric it's an electric appliance. But in certain areas, there's heat pump rates. So if we live in, a sp live in an area that has a special heat pump rate, whether this be for air source or ground source, you may be able to get a discount on that electric rate. And that's where you can really see some savings. So then if we dig into it a little bit and look at cost per million BTUs, the highest being electric resistance heat. That's a big hurdle we have to overcome, probably from ground source, same from air source, is we say it's an electric heating solution, and people think, crap, it's gonna cost me a ton to run this system because it's an electric heating system, because they're thinking of electric resistance heat. That's, that's the big hurdle we have to overcome. So that's the highest, then propane. If we look at natural gas, that's the lowest until you get into the cold climate heat pump with a heat pump rate, then that can actually become the most cost effective heating solution. Now, something that's a big difference, and I'm sure I think Tim somebody was going to talk about earlier when Tom asked about COPs, between air source and ground source is an air source heat pump is removing heat from the air outside. So obviously, as it gets colder out, it becomes less efficient. So we know that, because it has to work harder to remove that air outside. We did a study, not this winter, but the winter prior in Minnesota. And on the worst case scenario of these two homes that we studied, the COP got to 1.8, which is still pretty much comparable to about double the efficiency of electric resistance heat. Worst case scenario. We generally run in the upper twos to threes when it comes to COPs. So two and a half, three, three and a half times more efficient than electric resistance heat. That's a big benefit for ground source is that they maintain those higher COPs as it gets colder outside because ground temperature is consistent. I found this picture online and I kind of like it just because t Tom, I keep referencing Tom because he said a lot of things that I was going to say anyway. But he said, you know, the sanctity of life and how we have this beautiful we're heading down a path to go that way, which is not the way we want to go. That's why we're all here today. We want to continue on the path this way to keep our planet and ourselves and our future generations 
healthy, happy, beautiful, just like this. And the real way to do that, I drive it down to three main ways. Number one at the top being renewable resources, whether for your home or for the grids, getting those grids off of coal, getting them to run off of wind, off of solar, off of hydro. Then it's moving to our transportation, so electric vehicles. Then our space heating and water heating, heat pumps. Air source, ground source, heat pump water heaters, whatever it might be, moving to heat pumps, that's the way that we're gonna achieve what we wanna achieve. Um, one thing I wanted to mention, because Tom did bring it up before I got off of here, was water heating. That's something that we are working on that we'll probably see later this year where we'll have a heat pump that takes care of space and water heating as well. So that's definitely something we're working on. And then Brian mentioned about essentially the magic box that we have coming in that we're working on as well. Primarily developed for multifamily, but then also for smaller residential where we can incorporate space, water, dehumidification, ventilation, everything in its own little package. That's our, that's our ultimate goal. So, thank you. Okay, I think we'll continue on here. Thanks, Mike.